Today, let's talk about quadratic functions. Now, we've already talked about quadratic functions a little bit in this class and maybe in a, a past class or a past life, you've worked with them before. Let's take a look at the different forms that we will have with the quadratic functions. So the first form is what we call standard form, where we have it all expanded out, nothing factored. So a times x squared plus bx plus c. And where x is the, the input variable of the function and the a, b, c are real numbers. So it could be like 2, 3, 1 half, that kind of stuff. And then the vertex form, we write it, it's in a little bit of a factored form. It's a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k. And then the factored form is written as the quantity x minus r times the quantity x minus n. And r and n, are, again, are just numbers uh, that we're using. So this is variables representing numbers, but the x is a variable representing the input of the function. And so looking at what all of these forms have in common, well, they all have x, definitely, but they all have or will have an x squared in it. So the standard form, right away, you can see the x squared. The vertex form, you have the quantity x minus h squared. So you'll end up having x squared. And then in this factored form, when we distribute out the two quantities, you'll have an x squared in there. So they will all have x squared. And that's what defines the quadratic function is that that highest degree on the x is squared or two. So now let's take a look at the different properties that we always look at with functions. Um, let's start by looking at it in the vertex form. The vertex form can actually give us a lot of information about the graph and about the function itself. So first off, what is the vertex? Well, we call the vertex this point at the bottom. So you can see that the graph makes a, a U shape and at the base of the U, we call that the vertex. And so looking at this vertex form, when we are looking at the basic quadratic function, x squared, the shape is a parabola, we say. That's the name of this U shape, we say parabola. And in this case, this y equals x squared function opens up, but parabolas or the quadratic functions can open down as well. Um, the domain here, the lowest the x values go is all the way to negative infinity and the highest is all the way to positive infinity because we can plug in any number into x squared. We can square any number. So from negative infinity to positive infinity. And then the range, the lowest it goes is to zero and we include zero and the highest it goes, it goes up forever. And then we call that vertex point on this one. That is the point zero, zero. And we can talk about where's the function increasing, where's the function decreasing. So it's if we look from left to right, the left here, if you follow the graph along, it's going down. So it's decreasing and it starts decreasing all the way to negative infinity. So it's decreasing from negative infinity all the way up to it stops decreasing at that vertex at zero. And for increasing, decreasing, we always use parentheses. And then it starts increasing at zero and then continues increasing forever. And in this instance, this vertex is a minimum point. So it's a local and a global minimum of this function. Uh, this function also has even symmetry because it, we can reflect the function over the y-axis and it will mirror itself. And also if you look at you know, positive negative inputs, you get the same output out. You can see that in the table, plug in negative one, you get out one, plug in positive one, you get out one again. And so that axis of symmetry on this instance or on this one is zero, or in other words, that's the y axis. So now the last function that we analyzed was the linear functions and the linear functions had slope and we used the the slope to describe how the linear functions are growing or changing. On a quadratic function, we can't really find slope. We can, but it won't be a constant slope because the quantities are always changing. So to go from four to one, you actually do minus three. To go from 
one to zero, you do minus one. To go from zero to one, you do plus one, and then plus three. So there's not like a constant rate of change or a constant slope. But we can see some patterns in the y values. For example, they are symmetric. Right? There's this reflection in the y values. Um, so we can say that there is a symmetry centered at the vertex. What that means, and this will always be the case, no matter if we have different transformations happening to the function, we will always have the symmetry of the y values, but the symmetry is always going to be centered at the vertex. So in this case, the vertex is at 0, 0, but in other cases, the vertex may not be at 0, 0, but there will still be symmetry over um, that 0, 0, or over that vertex. Let's now take a look at a quadratic function that has a, a bit of transformations happening to it. And that's how we want to look at it. We want to look at it using the transformations. So let's see what kind of transformations we have going on here. So first, remember with the transformations, we always work on the inside, the parentheses first, just like order of operations. And we have x plus 3. So that's happening to the input. So it's affecting the x's. So it's, it's going to be some sort of shifting left or right x plus 3, it does the opposite of what we'd expect when we're, when we're dealing with the, the inputs. So this would be left 3. So let's draw that one out. If we take this and we go left 3, so we move the vertex left 3, 1, 2, 3. And also note, we have these other nice points on the graph. We have the point 1, 1 here and the point negative 1, 1. So those also get shifted left 3. So this is what we have after the first step, just doing that left three shift. And then next, working on the outside, we have two, well, three different operations happening on the outside. So order of operations, we'll work with the multiplying first. So we have this negative one fourth. The negative and the one fourth are kind of doing two different things. So the one fourth is compressing the y values. So it's a vertical compression. by one fourth or by the factor of one fourth. So what that means is we multiply all the y values by one fourth. And so everything's going to get really squished down here. So this point over here has a height of four and that's going to get squished down to a height of one. And then this height of one is going to get squished down to a height of, well, one fourth. And same thing with this other one over here. It's going to be reflexive or symmetric over that vertex. So it's really, really squished down. And so it's going to be flattened out something like this. Now, this isn't going to be super exact right now. We're just drawing the sketches of what happens. So this is the second part. And then next, along with the multiplication, we have the negative out front. So that is a vertical reflection or a reflection over the x-axis. Because when you have a negative on the outside, you're making all the y values negative. So when you make all the y values negative, you go from the top half to the bottom half. So the next step here is a reflection over x axis. So let's reflect over the x axis. And now all these points over here come down. And the y values become negative. So it's going to be nice and flat just like that all the way around. And then lastly, we have that plus one. So we have that shift up one. And I'm gonna do this one in a different color because it's already getting a little messy in here. But we should label this step three here. Um, so the last step is a vertical shift up by one. So I'm just gonna write up one. And so we take all those points and we shift them up one. So in the red, and uh, it's gonna get a little messy. This is the, the final graph out here. So this is the fourth and final form of the graph after doing all these transformations. In the, and that's in the red here. And we can also write out the different points in the table. So usually we want to center it at the vertex. So the vertex here, in, in fact, let's write that out, the vertex. If we look at what this point is, 
we actually go to the left by three and we go up by one. So that's what the vertex is. It's negative three, one. And in fact, the vertex is only affected by the vertical and horizontal shifting. The vertex isn't affected by any of the reflecting. And the reason being is because the vertex starts at zero, zero. So whenever you do any uh, compressing or stretching or reflecting, that point zero, zero is going to stay along on that x-axis. And so once you start doing the, the shifting, that's when the vertex changes. And so the vertex, in fact, is exactly the horizontal and vertical shifting. But to write out what that table is, we want to center at the vertex. So we want to have the center x value be negative 3. And then we can just order around negative 3. So this would be negative 4, negative 5, going in the negative direction, and then going increasing positive direction. This is negative 2 and negative 1. And we already have negative 3, 1 is the point, it's the vertex. And then we can get the other points on the graph by just plugging in these values into the function itself. So for x is negative 5, we would just plug in negative 5 for x. Let's write this out, at least on the first one, and then we'll just list out the other ones just to see how it, how it works. So the y is equal to negative 1 fourth times the quantity x plus 3 squared plus 1. But we're plugging in negative 5 in for the x. So this is negative 5 here plus 3. And negative 5 plus 3 is negative 2. So we have negative 2 squared plus 1. And we still have that negative 1 fourth out front. And so we square negative 2. That is positive 4. So this is negative 1 fourth times 4 plus 1. Negative 1 fourth times 4 is negative 1 plus 1. Well, then we end up with 0. And that's actually what we see on the graph if we count over to the left. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That is what that point is at negative 5 for x. The y is 0. And then we can do the same thing for the other ones. What we should end up getting is 0.75 here, or 3 quarters. And then for negative 2, it should be reflexive or symmetric over the vertex. So it should be 0.75. And if you plug in negative 2, you will get 0.75 in there. And the same thing for negative 1. We should get 0. And we do, in fact, get 0 when we plug in negative 1. So this is the table. And I continue to say that there's this symmetry over the vertex or this reflection over the vertex. And we actually call this the axis of symmetry. So what that means, in this case, it's not an even function anymore because it's not reflexive over the y-axis. But it does have a symmetry. It does have a reflection here. And that symmetry is over this line. So this is a vertical line. It's just like the y-axis, but it's just shifted to the left by 3. So this is the line we would call x equals negative 3. That's how we describe vertical lines, is an equation saying x is equal to that number. So we would often want to know what is the axis of symmetry. And the axis of symmetry on this function is negative 3. And in fact, we would say it as the equation x is equal to negative 3, because the axis of symmetry is in particular a line. It's this vertical line. It's not just a number. It's the vertical line. And we represent lines using equations. So we should always write the axis of symmetry as an equation because it's a line. So x equals negative 3. So breaking down the transformations and just in a general sense, we can identify some of the properties of the quadratic function by looking at this vertex form. So we know normally the A tells us any compresses or stretches. So this tells us if we compress or stretch. And in fact, it also tells us which direction the graph is facing. In particular, if the A is positive, then the graph is opening up. If the A is negative, then the graph is opening down. So if a is greater than 0, then it opens up like this. We'll just draw the graph. If a is negative, or if it's less than 0, then it opens down like this. And so the h tells us the horizontal shifting. And 
The K tells us the vertical shifting. So what that means, and we kind of talked about that in this last example we were graphing, the H and the K, when it's written in this vertex form, the, the general way to write it is we say X minus H because of that shifting is always negative or it's always opposite what we expect it to be in, when we are doing inside the parentheses. And so the H comma K, the vertex here, is this are these points, the H and the K. So the X part of the vertex is H and the K part of the vertex is K. So this is the vertex. And because this is the vertex, the X part of the vertex, or we would say X equals, in this case, H, which is the X part of the vertex, this is always going to be the axis of symmetry. Let's look at a couple of the quadratic functions in the standard form where everything's expanded out. So we're going to graph these using the Desmos graphing calculator. There's also instructions here for how to calculate using uh, a handheld ca graphing calculator. But let's use Desmos to graph this function. So we have the function y equals x squared minus 6x plus 5. So we can take a look at this graph and see all the different points that we're interested in. And we can get a rough sketch for this graph. So we see that it has a vertex here at 3, negative 4. And then it has these x-intercepts here at 1, 0 and at 5, 0. It also has these other nice points here at uh, 2, negative 3 and 4, negative 3 as well. And in Desmos, we can create a table by clicking the gear icon and then going to convert to table here. And then we can see it as a table. And naturally what it does in Desmos is it centers it at zero, but we want it to be centered at the vertex. So if we want to center it at the vertex, that's when X is three. So we'd have to adjust these values here. So we can make the center at three, so then that means you know, to the left or below the three is two, and then below that is one, and then going on the other side of three is four, and then five. So we can get our table here that is centered at the vertex. We just put in those x values that we're interested in, and then Desmos will give us the y values. So let's sketch this down onto the notes and talk about what the transformations are. So in the table, we had it centered at three. So this is two, this is one. And then going up, this is four and this is five. We had that vertex was negative four. So this was the vertex, remember? And then we have at two, that value is negative three, at one, that value is zero, and then it is symmetric over that vertex. So it should mirror those Y values. So this is negative three and this is zero. So to sketch that out, doesn't have to be a very perfect sketch, but we can just give a rough one. So let's say this is two, three, four, uh, five, and then one. So we had intercepts at, one and five and then we can go down and say this is negative four this is negative three so we had points here at three negative four and we had points at two negative three and four negative three so this is the rough sketch of this vertex along with its points so we have the quadratic function here or the parabola now, the parabolas are usually a little bit more curved and do a great job of showing it's curved, but they do have a little bit of curvature to them there. And so the transformations happening here, notice there isn't any stretching or compressing because if we look at the change in the Y values, this is a Y values going up one. And then going from here to here is also up one. So it's like that difference between the Y values next to the vertex are still one. In fact, it's a typo. This would be minus one if we're going 
in the down direction. And so the, the y values are not changing. That rate of change between them is, is the same. And so there's no stretching in here. And, and we can see that also because there's no coefficient in front of the x squared. So the only transformations happening are just right three and down four. So we can actually write the vertex formula here just knowing what the transformations are. Because just knowing what the transformations are, there's no A term, there's no stretching, so that A is just one. And then the horizontal shifting, we would say that's x minus three squared. And then we're going down four, so that's minus four on the outside. So we're just using those transformations that we have used before. And that gets us the vertex form. Now let's graph this next one, 2x squared plus 6x plus 11. So we have y equals 2x squared plus 6x plus 11. It's a little bit off the table here, so let's zoom out. There it is. Zoom back in to see the specific values that we have. And if we zoom in enough, what's actually happening here is that the vertex is at this halfway point. It's at negative 1.5, and the y value is 6.5. So that's the vertex, and we also have these other points here at negative 1 and 7, negative 2 and 7. And then if we scroll up a little bit, we also have a negative 0.5 and 8.5, and then negative 2.5 and 8.5. So let's create the table of this. And we want it to be centered at the vertex. So centered at the vertex, that means that x value, we want to be negative 1.5. And now there's different ways that we could look at the other x values. Let's still do the same thing. Let's increase or count up by one on the x values. So this would be add one to negative 1.5. That's negative 0 0.5 add one to that, and that is positive 0 0.5. And then going the other way from the vertex, this would be negative 2.5, and then two down from the vertex from the negative 1.5 would be negative 3.5. So we have these different values here, just we're counting up by one. We want to make sure that it's centered at the vertex. And this is the table that we have on this function. So let's fill that in or graph it out. We're just gonna make a rough sketch of this just to get an idea for where it is. So this is negative 1.5 and then 6.5. I know it's probably not very accurate or to scale, but we're just gonna sketch it out. And there we go, we have it. Uh, so now let's center at the vertex, negative 1.5, and that output is 6.5. And then we'll just count up. So this is negative 0.5 and then positive 0 0.5, and then going the other way, negative 2.5 and negative 3.5. And these outputs from the graph or from the function are 14.5, 8.5, and then it should mirror going the other way on the other side of the vertex. So this is 8.5 and 14.5. So again, this is the vertex here. And so there's actually a few transformations happening here. First off, we can say what the vertex is by saying transformation. So the vertex was shifted left 1.5 and up 6.5. So we went left 1.5 and up 6.5. But then there's also a stretching factor here. Because if we look at the vertex, and see, we counted up by one on each of these, and we see how much are we going up here? Well, this is plus two. And then same thing going from 8.5 to 6.5, this here is minus two. So normally on the original, if there's no stretching, it's plus one and minus one, but here it's plus two and minus two. So we're scaling those y values by two. So this is a vertical, I'm just gonna abbreviate V stretch by two. So we have all these transformations and we can write the squaring function, the quadratic, using the transformations in that vertex form. 
So we have the two out front times the quantity x. We went and left 1.5, so this is x plus 1.5 squared, because that's what the function is, and then up 6.5, so we add 6.5. And so all this is, is just doing the transformations that we've done before in previous units. And so the vertex form is very descriptive of the graph itself and very descriptive in showing what the transformations actually are. So one situation we might be given is that we might be told or have that the vertex of the parabola is 3, 4, and the parabola passes through another point, 1, 2, so we can use this information to be able to, for one, graph or sketch the parabola out, and then we can also find what the function is itself. So let's sketch out the point three four, which we have up here, and then we also have the point one two. And so now remember this point three four, this is the vertex, right? The the H K point. And so at the vertex, the parabola is symmetric. So that means that if we reflect over this axis of symmetry here, going down at negative or at positive three, this one point that we have, the point one, two, can actually be reflected over here. So we have another point here that is in fact, if we count one, two, three, four, five to the right. So this is X value of five and then a Y value of two. So we should have that axis of symmetry there. And just knowing that, we can actually sketch this out and get a rough idea for what the graph of the function looks like. But now to more definitively write out what this function is, we can look at the transformations like we did above. We can also just use the vertex form. So remember the vertex form is that f of x is equal to a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k and we can plug in for some of the pieces that we have and see what we don't have so when we are looking at you know we have the point three four is hk that's the vertex right and then we can plug that in so f of x is equal to a times x minus h which is three squared plus k which is four. So now to write this function in the vertex form, we just need that a. So to figure out what that a is, well, we have an x variable here and we have an f of x or you know the y or output variable here. So to find or solve for a, it might be helpful to be able to plug in a point that's on this function, on the graph of this function, and plug that in for the x and y, or the x and f of x. And we do have another point. We have the point one, two. So this is the x, y, or the x, and we can write it as f of x, that we're going to be plugging in. So let's plug this in and see what we get. So the f of x, or the y, is two. This is equal to a times x, which is one. And then the rest of what we have, minus three squared, plus four. And so now we have an equation with just one variable, and this is something that we know how to solve. So we just want to simplify everything and then get A by itself. So we'll be brave and do a couple steps at once. We can get A by itself. First, it's being multiplied by this number here, so we can't do anything with that just yet. But we have this plus 4 on the outside, so we can subtract 4 to cancel that out or add it to 0. And then we subtract 4 on the other side to keep it equal. And so what we have is two minus four is negative two is equal to a times. Now think about what this would be. This is negative two on the inside of the parentheses here, but then we're squaring negative two. So this is positive four. So we have a times positive four. To undo that multiplication, we divide by four. That divides to one. So we divide by four on the other side. And what we have left over is that a is equal to simplify, reduce this fraction by dividing by two in the numerator and denominator, this is negative one half. So this is what the A is. So going from this guy here, which is starred, we were just missing the A. So we 
So we have the a now, so we can plug the a in and leave x and f of x. So we have f of x is equal to negative 1 half times the quantity x minus 3 plus 4 on the outside. And this is what the function is in the vertex form. So we can also get the vertex form from the standard form by doing something that's called completing the square. So you might have done or heard of completing the square in the past, and it's sort of a form of factoring in a way. So completing the square, let's write out what each of these steps are and go through the process on this first one, and then we'll go through it on the second one as well. So the first step with completing the square is we group all the terms that have x in it. So we're going to group all x terms. So what I mean by group all x terms, that's saying that you have an x squared here and you have a negative 6x here. Those are the only terms with x in it. So we're just going to put parentheses around them. We're going to group it together. So we have y is equal to parentheses x squared minus 6x, close the parentheses, and then leave the plus 5 on the outside. So we're going to be working with this expression x squared minus 6x. And we're going to do what's called completing the square with it. So we don't have to do it on this example here. But the second step that we would do is factor out the a term from the x terms. Now what that means is that sometimes the a, the coefficient on the x squared, might not be 1. In this case, it is just 1, so there's not much we have to do there. But it's something that we, we need to do before we can do completing the square. We have to get the coefficient on the x squared to be just 1. So that's why we factor out the a. Even though the a term is 1, let's still just go through the motions and factor out that 1. So we have y is equal to, we'll just write 1 out front, times x squared minus 6x, still in the parentheses, and then plus 5 on the outside. And then the next step, and this is kind of the meat and bones of the completing the square, is we have to add something on the inside here with the x terms, because the goal is to get x plus or minus something squared, right? We want to get this vertex form that we have written up above here. So you want to get x plus or minus something squared. And that plus or minus something squared, it will always be the same thing every time, but it's always in relation to what you have on the x terms. So you take a look at the x terms that you have on the inside. In this case, we want to look specifically at the x term with just the x and not the x squared, so the x to the 1. And this part right here, we call it b. So that coefficient on the x term is b. So what we do to complete the square is we add b over 2 squared inside the group. So inside that x term grouping. So we add it on the inside of the group. And what we have to do to make sure we're allowed to, you know, add something is we always have to balance out what we did. So if we add b, b over 2 squared on the inside, we have to subtract the same thing on the outside. So it's the same idea, you know, if I give you $5 and then I and then you give me $5, at the end of the day, we have the same amount of money. So nothing changed. We just have different looking money. And so what we want to do is we want to subtract on the outside. We have to subtract the b over 2 squared. However, it's not just b over 2 because we have the a term that we factored out front also there. In this case, it's just 1, so it's not a big deal. But if we were to, if this was like 2 and we were to factor in or distribute in the 2, then we'd actually have added 2 times the b over 2 squared. So the point being is that the when the a term when we subtract on the outside comes along for the ride. So we subtract that on the outside. Now it's a lot of a lot of words and a lot of explanations. Let's see how that actually comes into play. So we have y is equal to 1 that's the a times the quantity 
x squared minus 6x, and we're going to be adding b over 2 squared. So remember, the b is the negative 6 here. It's the coefficient on the x term. So this is negative 6 over 2 squared. So we're adding that on the inside here. And then on the outside, so we have plus 5, we're subtracting what we added. So we want to subtract here the same thing. So we have the 1 out front, because remember, the 1 would be multiplied in. And so it's 1 times the negative 6 over 2 squared. And negative 6 over 2 squared, in fact, is 9. So we're really adding and subtracting 9 here. Well, this should be negative 9 because we're subtracting. And so that last step that we have is we factor it to be something nice. And that's the whole point of this. So we always will factor the group part, right? The stuff in the parentheses. We factor inside the group. And it's always going to factor as x plus the b over 2, all squared. And, and I, I'll write that out in a second, how that works. But let's write out what it should be. So we should have y is equal to, we'd have that 1 out front still, not that it makes a difference, x plus the b over 2. The b over 2, negative 6 divided by 2, is negative 3, so this is x minus 3, squared minus 4. And so this is what this factors to. And this is a good way, or a good process where you can always check your work at the end of the day. If you expand this out and combine all the like terms, you should end up with the same thing as what you started with. And that's always the goal, right? We don't want to change the equation itself. We just want to change what it looks like. But the way that this works off to the side here is this expression here would be x squared minus 6x plus 9. And if we want to factor, and this is a good review on factoring, to factor we see what two things multiply to 9, so what multiply to the c, that add to the b, that add to negative 6. So what two things multiply to 9 that add to negative 6? Well, negative 3 and negative 3 multiply to 9, but they add to 6. And so when we have x minus 3 times x minus 3, well, that's actually x minus 3 squared. So that's the factoring steps there, but it's always going to work out as x plus that b over 2 times that quantity squared. And that's the whole point of completing the squared, and that's why we add the b over 2 squared, because it's going to factor in this way. It's going to factor as x plus or minus something squared. So now let's go through the process on this one. And we actually have a coefficient out front, so this will be a good one to practice. So the first step here, we group all the x terms together. So we have y is equal to group 2x squared plus 6x plus 11 on the outside. And then we factor out the a term, and we do have an a term here. So we factor out the 2, so we're left with x squared. And then when we factor the 2 out, then we have the 6 is being divided by 2, so this is 3x, and then plus 11 on the outside. And then so the step 3 here, where we add the b over 2 squared, and then subtract it on the outside. So we have y is equal to sub that 2 out front times x squared plus 3x. And so the 3 here, the 3 is the b, and so we're doing 3 over 2 squared. So we're adding 3 over 2 squared. However, when we add 3 over 2 squared, so we have that plus 11 out here, we're really adding this 2 as being multiplied or distributing that 2 out front. So if we distribute the 2, this is 2 times 3 over 2 squared. So we have to subtract the same thing. So this is 2 times 3 over 2 squared. And since 3 over 2, we'll just use decimals, uh, since 3 over 2 is... 1.5, the way that this factors is 
y is equal to, we have the 2 out front, and it's going to factor to the x plus the b over 2. The b over 2 is the 3 over 2, so it's going to be x plus 1.5, all squared, plus, we can do some simplifications here. If you throw this in the calculator, 11 minus 2 times 1.5 squared, you should end up getting 6.5 here. And so this is the vertex form of this function in the standard form. And these are actually the same functions that we were graphing at the top of the page. And so let's take a look at just a general standard form quadratic expression. So we have a y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And we can see what happens when we do complete the square with this and see what is the end result that we will get. So let's do that first step. Let's group the x terms together. So we have y is equal to ax squared plus bx and then plus the c on the outside. And then we factor out the a. So that's step two, we factor out the a and we have a out front. So divide the a out of the first term. That's just x squared. But then when we divide the a out of the b, well, that's just going to be b over a times x. And then you still have the plus c on the outside. And then we do the part three, which is adding the b over two. And so before we, we add or subtract the b over two squared, um, let's just write what the b over two squared was, would look like. So we'd have b over a, this is the b, the b. The b is the coefficient on the x. So this is technically the, the b. And we're doing b over two and we're squaring that. So this would look something like when we have a fraction divided by a number, what we really are doing is we're doing the fraction in the numerator times the reciprocal of the denominator. So you can think of two as two over one, multiply by the reciprocal, but this is still all squared. So multiply fractions, you multiply tops with tops, bottoms with bottoms. So this is b over two times a, all squared. So let's keep that in mind. That's what the b over two squared is. I'll put that in quotes. The b over two squared. Even though it, it might feel a little confusing because we have b in there, but this is really the, the b is the, or was the b over a. So let's add that in and then subtract it on the outside as well. So go through that, that part three process. So we have y is equal to a out front. And on the inside, we have x squared plus b over a times x. And then we're adding on the inside here b over 2 squared, which we found to be b over 2a squared. And then we have to subtract the same thing on the outside. So this is plus c, but it's not just the same thing. We have the a that is coming along for the right. So the a is really multiplying the b over 2a squared. So we have to subtract a times b over 2a all squared. Now the punch line here is what we get in the end. So in the end, we get y is equal to, we factor it as x plus b over two. So it's gonna be a out front, and then it's going to be x plus the b over two. But remember the b over two is the b over two a. So this is x plus b over two a, all squared. And then you have plus, you know, all that stuff on the outside. The more important part is the, the b over 2a part. And the reason why that's important is because when we have something in vertex form, remember this is just like writing what the vertex is. This is the h. So we we're actually saying h, the x part of the vertex, is negative b over 2a. So we did this in a general way, and this is actually a big result here. We did this in a very general way that showed how to, no matter what your A or B or C is, it shows us how to get the X part of the vertex. And that's very important. And this is a nice sort of formula to get the vertex for any quadratic function.